This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. Violent crime, political unrest, financial instability. Everything points to an impending crisis, a crisis like no other. Tune in to World's Last Chance Radio to learn how you can spiritually prepare for what lies ahead. WLC Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's imminent return. Hello, I want to give you a very warm welcome to everyone tuning in today. Welcome to World's Last Chance, and I'm your host, Miles Roby. And I'm Dave Wright. We're glad you could join us today for an hour spent on things of eternal value. And today I've asked Dave to share with us about what constitutes the church, the, the true church. It's a rather important topic. Did you know that there are over 33,000 distinct denominations that make up worldwide Christianity? No, no, seriously? I, I knew there was a lot, but I didn't know there was anywhere that many. But before we dive into that, though, just by way of a taster, uh, I want to tell our first-time listeners that you may find your vocabulary somewhat expanded while listening to our show. (laughs) At WLC, we always use the personal name of the creator, which is Yahweh or Yah, God and Lord. Well, these are simply generic titles that are frequently used to apply to false gods and even demons as well. Yeah, Scripture repeatedly urges us to call upon the name of the Lord, but what the original Hebrew says is actually, call upon the name of Yahweh. You can't do that if you don't know his name. And what I personally find the most meaningful about Yahweh's name, however, is its meaning. Mm -hmm. Yahweh's name comes from a verb of being, which is hayah. It means literally to be. Now, what is so beautiful about this is that his very name becomes a promise. You're in danger and need of protection. His promise is, be safe. Mm -hmm. Your sins are swamping you with guilt. His promise is, be forgiven. It's really beautiful. This is how the world was called into existence. A literal rendering of Genesis chapter 1 is, light be, light was. Dry land be, dry land was. Mm -hmm. He wants us to know that the same creative power that called the universe into existence is encapsulated in his name and we can call upon him for help any time we need it. Absolutely, any time. I like the Saviour's name too. It incorporates the Father's name. The Saviour's name is Yahushua and it it means literally Yahweh saves. Now, it's so beautiful how in everything the Father and the Son are doing everything that can inspire faith and trust in us. Amen to that. Yeah. Well, like Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, if Yah be for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. Okay. Well, getting back to today's topic, most people, when they think of the church, in an abstract sense, think of the body of Christ. And there's a good reason for that. It's not a particularly bad understanding. It's just not quite correct. Yes, the definition can include, collectively, the body of Christians. But the primary definition of church is, quote, an edifice consecrated for public worship, especially one for Christian worship. Uh, While you were just talking there, Dave, I was just looking up the word church in the concordance. And the word doesn't appear in the Old Testament, but it does in the New. Uh, In fact, the first use of it is in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, where Yahushua says, I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Yahushua hadn't even died yet. Pentecost hadn't occurred. It would be rather hard to have an edifice called a Christian church that early on. Is that what you're getting at, Dave? Well, partly, yes. 
The word church appears in our modern Bibles exactly 80 times, and every single use of the word comes from the same Greek word, ecclesia. And the definition of ecclesia is neither an edifice intended for worship, nor collectively the entire body of Christendom. Now, I've brought my Bible dictionary in today, okay. and I've got the word marked, yes, uh, and it's reference number 1,577 in yep. the Greek section. So there it is. Could you just read it for us, please? Yeah, it's on that ribbon there. All right. It, uh, ah, it says, it's a calling out. So, quote, this word stresses a group of people called out for a special purpose. It's designated the new society of which Yahushua was, was the founder, uh, being as it was a society knit together by the closest spiritual bonds and altogether independent of space. That's ecclesia, yeah. Ecclesia yeah. comes from two Greek words, ek, which means out of, and klesis, which means a calling. So, so quite literally a, a calling out of. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So you can see why defining church as a body of believers is a good definition as far as it goes, but it's not a good translation of ecclesia. And church as an edifice for worship is even less accurate. Yeah, this is a really important point to understand, because more and more believers, they're finding themselves with no recourse but to home church. And when you've been raised going to church every weekend, when you come to expect the intellectual and emotional support that comes from surrounding yourself with people who believe like you do, mm -hmm. worshipping by yourself at home... Now, this can be very lonely. Well, worse than loneliness, though. I, I think it can also make you feel insecure, uh, especially in your own beliefs, uh, at least speaking for myself here. Uh, there's a lot of assurance from hearing a minister preach on what you already believe. It's reassuring to be surrounded by people, of course, who believe the same way that you do. It's, it's like a, a positive affirmation loop, isn't it, or something yeah, like no, that? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean, actually. When you don't have that, this can be very lonely and troubling, even mm. unsettling, actually. More and more people, they're finding themselves in just this situation, though. Would you say there's anything in Scripture, though, Dave, that can reassure someone that, that finds himself, himself or herself in this situation? I think most of us are used to surrounding ourselves with a group of like-minded believers, and it really is very reassuring, and, but also very unsettling when you no longer have that. I think it's more than just wanting reassurance that, yes, everyone else knows mm. we believe the same way. Mm. I think a large part of it is actually fear. What do you mean by that? Well, there are certain concepts in Scripture that have been used by those in church hierarchies to instill fear in their church members, fear of leaving, fear of being cast out. Now, you've got your Bible there, so could you just turn into the New Testament to Ephesians yep. chapter 4? Okay. And here, Paul is talking about the different roles believers have in spreading the truth. So once you've got it, can you go ahead and read verses 11 to 14, please? Sure. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of Yah, to a perfect man, to the measure of of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Tossed about by every wind of doctrine, deceived mm. by the trickery and dishonesty of men, deluded by cunning craftiness. No one wants to be deceived. Uh -huh. So we've all got this sort of idea that Satan has the power to deceive our minds against our will. We have to watch out that we don't inadvertently wander onto enchanted ground or, yeah. whoops, we'll be deceived and lost. Yeah. And no one wants that. But it does instill fear. Yeah, I know what you mean. There's, there's another fear that was really effective for a number of years, actually, in keeping me from... Uh, deep Bible study in Second uh, Timothy four verses three and four. It says, "For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables." And no one wants to have itching ears. No, absolutely. So we get this fear that if we investigate new light, if we even consider it, we'll somehow be entrapped and deceived against our will. So the question is, Dave, what do we do? 
The first thing to do is to realize that those fears come from Satan. Naturally, everyone who loves Yah wants to remain faithful to him. The devil plays on those fears and in a very real way keeps us from following on to know more truth. So when a pastor denounces anyone studying out new ideas as having itching ears, and we don't want to have itching ears, so we turn away from new light. We don't want to be blown around by every wind of doctrine. So when someone tries to share a new concept with us, we shut them down. Oh, yeah, I've, I've done that before as well. So we're all afraid of getting off. We, we don't want to be led astray. So we voluntarily uh, keep our beliefs limited to the creed of our particular church. And that plays right into the devil's plans. Yeah. Turn to John chapter 16, if you would. This is a passage we've all heard many times before, but we've never really paid attention to the significance of what Yahushua is saying here. But this is huge. Okay. Read verses 12 to 13, please. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. This is exciting. Right here, Yahushua is saying that he had more light, more truth to teach the disciples, but they weren't yet at a place where they could receive it. So what does that tell you? Well, there was more light yet to come. Yes, and that light would be taught to them individually by the Holy Spirit. Mm. We don't have to be afraid of new light. We don't have to be afraid of leaving the church or being kicked out of the church. That is not where we get our assurance of salvation. Our assurance of salvation comes from trusting in the merits of the blood of our Saviour, not because our names are on the membership rolls of the local church. Yeah, that's really assuring. No one wants to get off or be led astray, and yet it's really easy to fear that you're getting off if what you're studying starts to lead you away from the beliefs of your church and your spiritual community. Yeah, I understand. And that's why it's important to know what the Bible says about the body of of true believers. It's not the church. Mm. Our concept of church is incorrect. Yeah. Okay. Just hold that thought there, Dave. I'm going to take a quick short break. And when we return, we'd like to hear some more on this point. We'll be right back. If you have committed to worshipping Yahweh on his holy Sabbath, Calculated by his loony solar calendar established at creation, World's Last Chance has just the computer app for you. The World's Last Chance loony solar calendar guide was designed to meet the needs of lunar Sabbatarians worldwide. The algorithms used are extremely accurate and were obtained from Her Majesty's Royal Nautical Almanac Office in Great Britain. With our custom-created calendar guide, you can print off a loony solar calendar with corresponding Gregorian dates, or flip it around and print off a Gregorian calendar with corresponding loony solar dates. This is invaluable for calculating time off work. In addition, WLC's loony solar calendar guide provides a variety of astronomical information calculated for your specific area. You can learn the percentage of the moon illuminated, as well as sunrise and sunset times, and what time the moon rises and sets. Because the motions of the moon are so accurate, they can be predicted with great accuracy. This allows you to calculate future lunations so that work and school obligations can be scheduled around Yar's holy days. Visit our website at worldslastchance.com and start using it today. You can access it online, download it to your device or even integrate it into your own website. The WLC Looney Solar Calendar Guide, a great resource for everyone committed to honouring Yahweh on His holy days. In our last segment, Dave shared with us how the word church isn't really the best translation in the New Testament. The word is actually ecclesia, which means the called out ones. And yet we're all afraid of being led astray or being deceived. We don't like standing alone. 
It's unsettling, especially if your whole life you've enjoyed spiritual fellowship with a larger community of believers. Mm. It's easy to get the feeling that our assurance of salvation is linked to our church membership, but it's not. And again, those fears come from Satan. Miles, could you just turn over to Revelation chapter 14 in your Bible there? Here, John is describing a very special group of people. Every soul that is saved is precious to the Father, but this group is particularly singled out. They're special in a way no other group has ever been. So could you just read verse 1 and then verses 3 to 5 of Revelation 14? And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto Yahuwah and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of Yah. The 144,000 sing a new song that no one else can learn. This doesn't mean that someone could learn the melody or the lyrics. This means that it is the song of their experience. The 144,000 have an experience that no other group of believers have ever had or ever will have. Now, when it says they're virgins, that that doesn't mean literal virgins, does it? No, no, it means they are spiritual virgins. They have a pure faith. Verse 5 says, In their mouth was found no guile, adding that they are without fault before the throne of Yah. That's an incredible endorsement as well. We know from Romans that everyone has sinned, so to be found without fault before Yah means that they have to have reached such a point of full surrender that the character of Yahushua is perfectly reproduced in each one of them. You know, they're pure, they're faultless. It's, it's amazing, really is. H- how were they ever able to reach this point, though, Dave? Through faith. By faith, they accepted the merits of Yahushua's blood to cover their sins. By faith, they took Yah at his word and claimed the promise that he would write his law in their hearts. By faith, they fully surrendered and allowed Yahushua to live his life in them. Which sounds great, but how? Can can you give us some specifics? Well, the answer is found in verse 4. If you could just read that again. Okay. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, that's merely the result. Read the next sentence. That's the how. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. That's why the 144,000 perfectly reflect the image of Yah. They follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Their eyes are on the Saviour, not a pastor. Just like Yahushua did, they learn truth directly from Yah. So if in following the Lamb they are led out of the church they've attended all their lives, they're not worried about it. They're following the Lamb, and that's all that matters. I'm I'm glad you said that, because, because I have to admit, as much as I've learned and as much as I know now... There are times when I still feel very alone, though. You know, it's, it's a solitary walk. It really is. It's not easy no, at all. No, it's not. But there's actually precedence for Yah's followers to stand alone. Well, yeah, Jeremiah was pretty much alone in his message of doom for Jerusalem. Well, no, I mean quite literally. Take all Moses, right. for example. Okay. He thought he was ready to deliver Israel when he was 40, but <laughs> Yah knew better. He wasn't ready for his life's work until 40 years later after he'd learned patience tending sheep in the wilderness. And then there's Elijah. Before he stood alone before Ahab, he was alone at the brook Cherith for, well, we don't know how long. Then he was tucked away in a little village in a foreign country. Mm, and that's true. And then there's John the Baptist as well, just, just come to my head, a man of the wilderness. Yeah, right. All of these, and actually many more, live very solitary lives. They learned from Yah, not from rabbis or pastors or priests. It was being under Yahweh's direct tutelage that prepared them for their life's work. We are all called to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. But let me ask you this. 
if you're keeping your eyes on the lamb, if you are indeed following him and regardless of where he may be leading, you're keeping step with him and someone else, maybe a pastor or respected spiritual leader, takes his eyes off your divine leader and refuses to follow, just which one of you has chosen to separate from the lamb? Well, the one who quits following. We've got to quit getting our reassurance of salvation from how many people we surround ourselves with who believe like we do. Listen, the majority are going to be lost. Why would you care if the majority are against you when you know the majority will be lost? Yeah, that's true. You see, we need to remind ourselves of Yahushua's words in Matthew 7, where he explained, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You see, it can feel uncomfortable to stand alone, but it's often necessary. Truth is ever increasing to those who follow the Lamb. That's a principle of righteousness. This means that every single truth seeker who's committed to following Yah will sooner or later be faced with advanced light that is different than what he believed or practiced before. Mm. So if the church you're worshipping with doesn't accept this advanced truth, you will be led out and, and will be separate from them. The problem with the church is that the emphasis is on an organized group that's governed by some authoritative hierarchy. Mm. There's usually a governing body that oversees the running of the group. Now, the danger is the leadership often has been given the authority to define the structure's beliefs and suspend its monies. Yeah. You see, of course, when your paycheck is connected to maintaining the status quo, even the most dedicated minister is going to have personal motivation to reject anything that challenges that status quo. This agenda to maintain that status quo is further complicated when an organisation seeks government recognition. Now, I'm not saying that there are not good reasons to have that. In some countries, it's illegal to assemble for worship unless the group has that official recognition. In other countries, though, it's often for purely financial reasons, so they don't have to pay taxes. So you're saying it's a sin, then, to seek that official recognition? No, no, not at all. However, people need to be aware that it can open the door for Satan to gain control by, at a later date, changing the legal requirements to gain official recognition. Mm. If your doctrines are considered politically incorrect, it can be very tempting to adjust the theology, or at least downplay certain aspects of it, in order to retain the benefits that come with legal recognition. Yeah, that's true. Uh, whatever the state grants permission to do, it can also, at a later date, revoke that permission as well. Don't be afraid to home church, folks. Yahushua said, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Home churches aren't just an alternative form of worship for believers in these last days. They are actually the only viable option available for truth seekers. Every church likes to think of itself as the remnant church, the one church that has all the truth. But the reality is that every single denomination has, on some point or other, either clung to old errors or actively rejected advancing truth. Mm, I, I, I agree. One error, though, probably the biggest error that every single organised denomination has made has been to calculate their days of worship by the Catholic Gregorian calendar. Now, if this is your first time joining us, by the way, and you're listening right now, you might be going, yeah, so what? Well, the so what <laughs> is that the Gregorian calendar is a papal calendar. And it's designed at the behest of Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, And not only that, but it's an adaption of the Julian calendar. And the Julian calendar comes from pure paganism. It's a solar calendar based exclusively on the sun. Now, by contrast, the biblical calendar used both the sun and the moon for calculating time. What my point is, you cannot find the actual day of Yahushua's resurrection on the papal solar calendar, and you certainly can't find the true biblical Sabbath. Now, if it's important to you to honor Yah by celebrating the resurrection on the first day of the week, I have to tell you, the actual day of the resurrection is not Sunday of the modern week. Likewise, if you understand the perpetuity of the divine law and want to worship the Creator on the seventh day Sabbath again, that's not Saturday. No organized denomination, to my knowledge, actually calculates their worship days by the biblical calendar. And as a result, there is not a single church today that actually honors the Creator by worshiping on his actual holy days. 
to determine when the true Sabbath occurs, when the real day of the resurrection is, you have to use the biblical calendar. Yeah, and no church today uses that. Instead, it's it's more convenient to use the papal uh, pagan Gregorian calendar. If you needed no other reason to leave the organized churches, that alone is reason enough. Follow the lamb wherever he goes, and you'll follow him right out of every single denomination out there. It's important to remember as well that Yahweh reads the heart. He's not condemnatory. Acts 17 verse 30 says, Truly these times of ignorance Yahweh overlooked. But then it quickly adds, quote, But now commands men everywhere to repent. We aren't responsible for truths we've never learned. However, we are responsible for the truth we do know. Mm. The knowledge of the true Sabbath is being restored. We now have a responsibility to obey this truth. Listen, if you'd like to learn more about the biblical calendar that I've been talking about earlier on and how it actually works, please visit our website, worldslastchance.com. We've got dozens and dozens of articles covering every single aspect of this important topic. You can also check out our videos on YouTube, our WLC videos, uh, but just get studying. Go for it. You know, obeying all the light available is an integral part of following the Lamb with us however He goes. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. David said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, adding, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Knowing what the Bible says, hiding its treasures in your heart brings immense rewards. The principles of Scripture are an unerring guide in every situation, while the promises of Scripture provide comfort and courage through all of life's trials. Visit us at worldslastchance.com and learn the benefits of memorizing Yah's Word. Check out Memorizing Scripture, A Matter of Life and Death on worldslastchance.com. world's last chance, we understand that following truth can exact a very high price. Yahushua said that gaining the kingdom of heaven was like a merchant man who gave up all that he had in order to obtain a pearl of great price. In other words, the cost of following truth, no matter what the cost, is everything. This may sound courageous in theory, But it can be scary when your job, and your ability to earn a living or get an education, is at risk. If you find yourself in a difficult situation at work or school, World's Last Chance can help. On our website, we have articles that can teach you the skills needed for negotiating accommodation in both work and school. We also provide examples of letters that can be used when writing to employers or school administrators. Check out Worship and Job Conflicts on worldslastchance.com Once again, that's Worship and Job Conflicts on worldslastchance.com Let us help you get accommodation for time off work or school to worship YAH. Right, 
Shimanga Kayuni from Blantyre, Malawi, has an interesting question for our daily mailbag, and he writes, Greetings, brothers. May Yahuwah continue to bless your work. What are your thoughts on deliverance ministries? Are they biblical? Hello, Chimanga. That's an interesting question. Mm. Well, first, for those unfamiliar with the term, let's just explain what we mean by deliverance ministries. Deliverance ministries are based on the idea that a person that is addicted to, say, drugs or pornography or any other psychological problem is actually possessed by a demon. And it doesn't have to be anything as specific as drugs, alcohol or pornography. Some claim to be possessed by the demon of pride or the demon of laziness, whatever. Anyway, it's believed that with prayer and the laying on of hands or a combination of practices, the person can be delivered from the demon that is oppressing them with sin. But wait a minute, isn't that like sort of saying the devil made me do it? I mean, I mean we definitely know that there's a spiritual war going on, but doesn't the Bible actually teach that we're to take more personal responsibility for our own sins? Yeah, it does indeed. Just turn over there to the book of James, chapter okay. 1. And here, James is speaking about temptation and right. where it comes from. Just read verses 12 to 15, please, for us. Okay. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which Yahweh has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by Yah, for Yahuwah cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Unlike Yah, Satan does tempt, but he cannot compel us to sin. James is very clear on this point. He says, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. We all have cultivated and inherited tendencies to sin. We sin when we give in to our own sinful desires and indulge rather than resisting the temptation in the strength of Yahweh. So it's not some demon in us that needs to be cast out because the demon is making us sin. No, think about it for a moment. If a demon truly were possessing us and forcing us to commit a sin, we would not be responsible for that sin anyway because the act was done without our consent. Yeah, well, that's true. And yet we know we are responsible for our own sins that, that we commit. Because we sin. We yeah. commit the wrongful act by consenting to do it. Yeah. Unless we have consented, we are not responsible. Yeah, but, but since Scripture makes it clear that we are responsible for our sins, we've obviously consented to it. Right. So the very premise on which this concept of deliverance ministries is based is flawed and contradicts what Scripture teaches about sin. Another problem with deliverance ministries is that it focuses on the power of Satan. Now, granted, the devil is far more powerful than any human, but we don't have to battle the devil in our own strength. He's a defeated foe. Yahushua has won. That's what we need to stay focused on, not the power of Satan. Yeah, all that does is instill fear. And I've known people who are so focused on the power of Satan and so afraid of him that their faith loses hold of the power of Yah to deliver. And Yah's power to deliver is far greater than Satan's power yep, to oppress. Absolutely. Let's take a look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. That's 1 John Chapter 5, verse 18. Yep. And if you could just go ahead and read it for us, please, Miles. I'll get it there with my ribbon. We know that whoever is born of Yah does not sin, but he who has been born of Yah keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Yahweh protects those who have given themselves to him. It says so right there. Mm. And the wicked one does not touch him. With that being the case, then, it begs the question of why deliverance ministries have gotten started at all. Well, as we said, it focuses on Satan's power and instills fear. It might actually open a door to letting demons come in. In what way do you mean? Well, a, a person who keeps his eyes on Yah and stays focused on the promises, a person who uses those promises to live a life fully dedicated to Yah, mm -hmm. the wicked one does not touch him. Mm. However, the danger arises when your focus shifts. When you take your eyes off Yah and focus instead on the power of Satan, you start comparing your strength to the devil's. You realize how weak you are. You get scared and you lose your grip on divine power through the promises of Yah. 
One thing I've actually seen plenty of deliverance ministries do is blame demonic harassment on inanimate objects. Now, they say that a demon can accompany specific items in your home, so often they'll ask the person seeking deliverance if they've been given something new recently, uh, and if they have, uh, they'll tell the person to get rid of it. And I remember once hearing about a situation where it was claimed a demon was accompanying a Bible that had recently been given to the person. You know, <laughs> on the surface, this sounds possible, if not plausible. What does the Bible say about this idea then? Well, how can a demon possess something that isn't alive? Mm. Let's think of the demoniacs at Gergesa. When Yahushua cast them out, they begged to be sent into what? The rocks, the water? If demons could inhabit something inanimate, the water would be the perfect thing to inhabit because then mm. they could go wherever the water was. Yeah, no, no, they beg to be allowed to go into the swine. If someone is struggling with a particular sin, and all sin is addictive, but if someone is struggling to overcome a specific sin, sure, you can try to cast out the demon of movies or the demon of alcohol or whatever. But how much more effective would it be to share the truth of Yahweh with the person? Share the promises. Give the Holy Spirit a chance to work on the person's heart. When Yahweh writes his law on our hearts, the spirit of disobedience is conquered and the devil has to flee. Demons cannot inhabit a child of Yah. But what about unbelievers? Well, yes, unbelievers can be possessed. But even here, we are to pray for them, share truth with them, lead them into a saving knowledge of Yahushua. Could you just read Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, please, Miles? And here it's talking about what Yahushua accomplished with his death. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Yahushua triumphed over them, not us. So any prayed-for deliverance must always be done in his name and based on the merits of his blood. But what really needs to be prayed for is the person's individual salvation, not simply deliverance from the demon of vanity or whatever. Yeah, I appreciate hearing your thoughts on this too. Believers should be praying for people in their lives anyway, but it's always seemed to me that deliverance ministries focus too much on Satan and his power. And in doing this, they end up giving the devil far more power than he actually has. Yes, no, I agree with that. A true Christian will focus on Yahweh and him alone. Absolutely. That's where the power is at. Look at your divine deliverer, not the enemy who's already defeated. Okay. Uh, got time, I think, for just one more quick question. This is Chu Hua Yang from Wuhan, China, asks this question. Why do you refer to Yahuwah as the creator? John uh, chapter 1, verse 3, says that Yahushua created all things. I'm glad you asked that, Chu Hua. You're right. John chapter 1, verse 3 says, quote, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Mm. That said, Yahuwah is the originating life source of everything, even his son. Now, obviously, Yahushua is not a created being, but he is begotten. He is the begotten son of the Father, but he is still begotten. Only Yahuwah is self-existent. However, in the beginning, Elohim created the heaven and the earth. And Elohim said, let there be light, and there was light. Exactly. This point is obscured in our modern translations. In most modern translations of the Bible, it simply says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But in the original, it uses the Hebrew title Elohim, which is a plural word that refers to the Father. You see, just another example of why it's always good to be accurate and, and use the actual names of the Father and the Son. Right. The originating source of all life has always been the Father. That's all we've got time for today, but please do keep sending your questions in and your comments as well. We always enjoy reading them. Just go to worldslastchance.com and click on Contact Us. It's quick, it's easy as well. Just click on Contact Us at worldslastchance.com.
This is Elise O'Brien with today's Daily Promise from Yah's Word. The Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, Silence is a source of great strength. When the prophet Elijah had fled the anger of Jezebel, Yahweh did not forsake him. Instead, he used the opportunity to teach Elijah an important lesson, one that we need to learn too. Elijah learned that the presence of Yah was not in anything big and mighty, showy or noisy. Instead, it is found in silence and stillness as the believer turns aside from earthly distractions to spend time with the Creator. 1 Kings chapter 9 records the story. Elijah was told, Go forth and stand upon the mount before Yahuwah. And behold, Yahuwah passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before Yah. But Yahuwah was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But Yahuwah was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But Yahuwah was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. If you're in a situation where you don't know what to do, if you feel like a snowball caught in the avalanche of life, listen for Yahweh's still small voice speaking to your heart. He'll tell you what to do. He'll open a path before you that is safe to follow. In the first chapter of James, believers are given the promise, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of Yah, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. I like that. To upbraid means to reproach or severely reprove. To upbraid someone means to treat him with contempt. Yahweh promises that if you go to Him for wisdom, He will freely give it to you, and He's not going to scold you or make fun of you for needing to ask. Go to Him for wisdom and guidance. Pray and listen for His voice in the silence. He will hear and answer you. We've been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. Well, I have to admit, Dave, I feel somewhat better about home churching after learning that the original word was a calling out. I mean, that's the exact opposite of being included as a member of an organized denomination, isn't it? If you continue to attend a church that's been presented with the truth and yet has refused to obey that truth, you dishonor Yahweh. For a church to be blessed with the divine presence, all known light must be obeyed. You can't honour Yah while clinging to known error. Even a single error clung to in the face of advanced light will deny the church of the presence of Yah. And I'm not being melodramatic here. Mm. Do you remember the story of Ichabod? Uh, oh, do you know what? The name sounds vaguely familiar, but I just, I just don't remember the details. Oh, well, let me remind you. Back in the days of Samuel the prophet, while he was still young, the Israelites went to war with the Philistines. The war hmm, wasn't going well. So the Israelite leaders decided to bring the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield. Right, yeah, yeah, I remember now. Using it like a, a magical talisman. Hmm. Uh, the Philistines actually captured the Ark of the Covenant. They also killed high priest Eli's sons, Hophni and Phineas. The ark should never have been taken to the battlefield. No. Now, when the word came to high priest Eli that his sons had been killed and the ark stolen, he fell off his chair, broke his neck and died. But that's not all. Apparently, Phineas had a pregnant wife. 
Actually, let's just read it really quickly. It's in okay. 1 Samuel chapter 4, and it's verses 19 to 22. Could you just yep. read that for us, please? I've got it here. And Phineas's wife was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of Elohar was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed. For her pains came upon her, and she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. Because the ark of Elohar was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband, and she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of Eloah is taken. Now this poor woman understood that the glory of Israel was directly related to the presence of Yah. Sinners can't live in the presence of Yah because he is holy. The Shekinah glory, the visible presence of Yah's glory departed, and so too did the glory of Israel. Now, this same principle holds true in the churches today. You can't continue in known sin or continue to embrace doctrines you've been shown are wrong and expect to have the blessing and presence of Yah. It's just not going to happen. Mm. But even in a humble home church where worshippers desire to honour Yah, there he is, right in the midst of them. And another principle that's good to remember is given in Amos 3 verse 3, where Yahuwah asks, Can two walk together except they be agreed? If you share truth with your church family and it's rejected, you have no other option than to withdraw from the fellowship of a church with whom you disagree. The only organized body of believers recognized by Yahweh is the called out ones who are following the lamb where he goes. He is the head of the true church, the remnant of the called out ones. So could you just turn there to the first chapter of Colossians and read verse 18, please? He, Yahushua, is the head of the body, the church, the called out ones, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. You want to know who the true church is? It's every person who has chosen to follow truth regardless of the cost. They're not gathered in the churches that have all refused to accept advancing light. The called out ones are scattered all around the world. They are the ones that truly honour Yah and glorify his name. Yehoshua told Pilate that his kingdom was not of this world. If we want to follow him, we won't be of the world either. Do you remember how Yehoshua described his followers in John 17? Mm. Just um, just give me a second to to find that for for a moment. Um, Here he is. Just one second. He's praying just before his betrayal, and he says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So Yah's followers, just like Yahushua, are to be in the world, but not of the world the world yes and i find it interesting that the last verse you read brings it back full circle yeah back around to obedience to the truth yahushua was in the world but not of the world and if we want to follow him we will be too mm. and, and, and we're not going to align ourselves with churches that worship by a counterfeit calendar a calendar that actively dishonors the very one that's it's claiming to worship and that's exactly why in revelation 18 yahuwah actually commands believers today to leave all organized religions. Would you just remind us and read the first five verses of Revelation again for us? Sure, I've got it just right here. After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and Yah has remembered her iniquities. Don't make the mistake of thinking that your church is exempt, and that your job is to go out and invite everyone else to come join your denomination. Now, a better translation of this verse is, Go out of her, my people. Now, this is a command, folks. This is not an invitation. Wine is intoxicating. It numbs and confuses the mind. And it's also a symbol of error. 
The error which Babylon, or the papacy, has enforced on the entire world is the false papal calendar. Even Muslims use it. They go to mosque on Fridays for prayers. The command to leave Babylon is absolute. If you want to honour Yah, if you want to follow the Lamb all the way, you won't stay in any organisation that teaches even a single error. The so-called remnant church isn't an organisation. It's Yah's faithful, called out ones, scattered all over the world. Amen. In closing, I just want to add that if you want to be preserved from Satan's delusions in the days ahead, it's vitally important that you choose to follow Yahushua all the way. And that includes being willing to leave Babylon, even if you're the only one who does. Join us again tomorrow. And until then, remember, Yahuwah loves you and he is safe to trust. If you would like to hear past episodes of WLC Radio, you can find them on our website at worldslastchance.com or look for them on YouTube. Have you heard of the WLC Reward System? World's Last Chance is eager to partner with you in preparing for heaven. In our WLC store, we offer a collection of items designed to aid you in your spiritual journey. There are books, audiobooks, resources on CD-ROM and MP3, videos, as well as a number of truth-sharing tools for holding your own Bible studies with friends and neighbours. We even have a youth section with items to appeal to the younger members of the family. The best part? You don't have to pay a single cent for any of it. This is where the reward system comes in. When you become a registered member on our website, there are a variety of ways by which you can earn reward points to be spent in our store. There are currently 31 e-courses available for study on our website. Each completed e-course accrues points. The accumulated points earned will be instantly transferred to the member's account once the course is complete. You can earn over 6,000 points on e-courses alone. But that's not all. Correctly answering the daily quiz, responding to the weekly survey and even accessing an English content item can all earn you points. The points you earn can then be spent on the items available in our WLC store. We mail to anywhere in the world at no cost to you. We'll even cover the cost of shipping and handling. Visit our website at worldslastchance.com. Start earning points today. Not all items are available in all languages. Visit our website today to see what's available in your language. World's Last Chance is dedicated to preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Our shortwave radio programmes broadcast daily in seven different languages around the world, with more languages to come. Our videos and articles have been translated into over 30 different languages. And we're not just focused on any one point of doctrine. We want to partner with Heaven in bringing all truth to the world. Our articles and videos cover a variety of topics important to the growth and development of the Christian walk. We present material covering, practical piety in daily living, biblical beliefs grounded upon the word of Yah alone, the Creator's calendar, and end-time prophecies vital for you to know. We even cover various incorrect winds of doctrine Satan has used to deceive many and demonstrate from Scripture why it is wrong 
and what is the truth. Visit us today at worldslastchance.com. Learn the truth for these last days. world's last chance, we understand that following truth can exact a very high price. Yahushua said that gaining the kingdom of heaven was like a merchant man who gave up all that he had in order to obtain a pearl of great price. In other words, the cost of following truth, no matter what the cost, is everything. This may sound courageous in theory, but it can be scary when your job and your ability to earn a living or get an education is at risk. If you find yourself in a difficult situation at work or school, World's Last Chance can help. On our website, we have articles that can teach you the skills needed for negotiating accommodation in both work and school. We also provide examples of letters that can be used when writing to employers or school administrators. Check out Worship and Job Conflicts on worldslastchance.com Once again, that's Worship and Job Conflicts on worldslastchance.com Let us help you get accommodation for time off work or school to worship YAH. facing a situation where you need divine help and guidance, there is power in prayer. Yahweh is just longing to answer the prayer of faith. If you would like others to join with you in prayer, visit our website and click on prayer requests. The WLC team prays over the prayer list each day and others around the world can join with you in seeking the Father's face. Remember, prayer moves the arm of omnipotence. Let us join you in prayer at worldslastchance.com. been listening to WLC Radio. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 93.30 kilohertz on the 31 meter band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Mm -hmm.